Reverend Diane Martindale, this year's president of the League of Women Voters, and we're pleased you could join us. Are there people here today that um, who have never been to a league meeting? Raise your hand. Any? Especially welcome. Yeah. The League of Women Voters does not endorse candidates or political parties, but does encourage informed and active civil engagement. We work to increase understanding of major public policy issues, influence public policy through education and advocacy, and do take stands on issues after study and consensus. If you're interested in learning more about the League, there's information at the back of the room, and there's a little donation basket because when we put on our voter forms, they do cost money, and we appreciate anything you'd like to throw in the basket. I've got two announcements. <clears throat> Today, joining us for this discussion from the Washington State League of Women Voters Board are, please stand, Raylene Gold, a member of the lobby team for natural resources, Pat Dickison, first VP and advocacy chair, who's finally getting a break after the legislative session, and Kim Abel, president, and Jane Freudenberger, our liaison and board member from Bellingham. On May 12th, we're having a special program along with our annual membership meeting where we vote in a new board and budget. Cindy Hansen from the Whale Museum will talk about the health of our orcas and our relationship with them. The talk is entitled Orcas and Humans, Emotions and Economics. As a tourism-based community, we are somewhat economically dependent on our orcas and we have many questions. If you're not a league member, this is a good opportunity to join us for the program and get a better glimpse of how we operate. The public is welcome. There is a charge because lunch is served, and it starts at 11.30 at the San Juan <coughs> Golf and Country Club, and it's a delightful location because there's plenty of parking. Anybody who needs a lift from the ferry dock, we will provide it. And uh, there are chairs. All the chairs are out, and there's one empty here, so please feel free to come up and take it. Your other option is the floor, which I wouldn't recommend. But. I'd like to introduce our talented and hardworking program chair, Sarah Crosby, who will guide this afternoon's presentations. Hi, and welcome. It's nice to see some new faces as well as our regular league members. Um, before we get started, I have a program note about our June 18th meeting. This will be the first in a series of talks on climate change, which the League is addressing along with other local organizations over the next year to 15 months. We will be co-sponsoring along with the National Park Service, the Madrona Institute, and the San Juan Island Library, among others. Um, a series which is entitled The Climate Action Imperative, Understanding <coughs> Impacts and Making Choices. This series will run from June into September and there will be one or two talks, actually two or three talks each month for that period. Um, this particular talk will take place on Wednesday, June 18th from 7 to 8.30 p.m. at Brickworks. Our speaker is Dr. Richard Hebda. He is Curator of Botany and Earth Science at the Royal British Columbia Museum. He's also Professor of Botany at the University of Victoria School of Earth and Ocean Sciences. His talk, which as yet is untitled, um, will cover the signs of climate change in <coughs> the Northwest as he sees them now also the changes that we can expect in the near future and how we might adapt to them. So stay tuned. Those of you who are members um, will be getting into more detail in our voter and we'll also advertise this in the local media. Dr. Hebda is a really dynamic speaker. Um, various of our islanders have heard him speak on other issues and they're very excited that he's coming here to be part of the speaking series. So do join us. Also, I want to thank Tom Muncy and San Juan Access Television. Tom films the educational meetings of the League of Women Voters, and prior to this time, he's been 
giving us DVDs, much to the chagrin of our local libraries. They don't know how to catalog them. So henceforth, we will be putting our um, educational meetings up on YouTube, so everyone will have access to them, and we find that this is a more environmentally <laughs> friendly sort of alternative. And now to our program. The major justification for the proposed terminal and refinery projects in the Northwest is jobs. While in the short term there will be indeed an increase of jobs during the construction phase of these projects, many of the jobs will disappear as the construction is completed and mechanization of the operation is set in motion. The long-term effects of these projects, however, reach far beyond jobs. Human health, maritime environments, agriculture, our local economies, and potentially the landscape at large will be affected by the increase in vessel traffic through the Salish Sea. Most especially, the risk of accidents and possibly disastrous oil spills will greatly increase if all of these projects are approved and completed. Many people say that we are helpless in the face of big business, multiple governments, and the need for fossil fuels for our energy consumption. However, circumstances change rapidly in our modern world. China is closing coal plants and embracing alternative energies in an effort to clean up their pollution problem. Citizens are demonstrating in many countries against the use of energy which challenges the health of their citizens. Here at home, where there is a steady movement towards renewable energy, people are questioning the use of fossil fuels and government policy which encourages that use. More pertinent to our discussion today, citizens are looking more carefully at the human and environmental costs of fossil fuel energy production. Oil spills take a terrible toll in marine life, degradation of marine environment and shorelines, in local economies of, of communities affected by the spills, and potentially on human health. Here to talk about the risks of spills and their potential effect on the waters, animal life, and denizens of the Salish Sea are our speakers for today, Lovell Pratt and Sean Hubbard. Lovell, a former member of the San Juan County Council, has represented the Washington State Association of Counties on the Puget Sound Partnership Oil Spill Work Group. She also served on the Vessel Traffic Risk Assessment Steering Committee and on the Rulemaking Advisory Committee of the Oil Spill Contingency Plan. Sean, a graphic artist and longtime environmentalist, uses her graphic arts and marketing skills to motivate people to get informed and involved on the issues they feel passionately about. Among Sean's issues is the restoration of the habitat for the Gary Oaks on Katy Mountain, and more recently, the proposed Gateway Pacific Terminal in Bellingham, and as well as the increased vessel traffic through the Salish Sea. Both women are longtime residents of the San Juan Islands and have steeped themselves in the issues we want to talk about today. After their formal talk, we will open up the meeting to questions from the audience. So that they can answer as many questions as possible, we urge you to keep your questions to a single point and to refrain from making a statement along with your question. After the talk, we hope that you will join our voices with your own to encourage Islanders to inform themselves and to use their voices, pens, emails to speak out about <coughs> this issue which is so vital to all of us. And with that, I give you Lovell and Sean. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Lee, for inviting us here today. So, Lovell is a walking Wikipedia on the ins and outs and the who's who of all this fossil shipment. You will see. Um, I'm new to the subject. About two years ago, my eyes were wide open when I learned about the, um, the coal terminal that, that was proposed for Cherry Point. I think that's when a lot of, of islanders actually got involved in this issue. Um, so I'm not an expert. But I keep thinking of uh, the poet Mary Alwer when she says, instructions for living a life, pay attention, be astonished, and tell about it. So here we are today. 
Earth Day is uh, next week. We get to celebrate it. Hopefully it'll be on the front page of all the newspapers. I recently learned that the impetus for organizing the first Earth Day on April 22nd, 1970, was actually an oil spill off the coast of Santa Barbara in 1969. It was our country's third worst spill after now, Deepwater Horizon, and 25 years ago, Exxon Valdez. On that first Earth Day, 44 years ago, I can't believe it was 44 years ago, 20 million people marched in the streets. At the time, that was 10% of our population. 20 million. I can't even imagine that happening today. So, what they were protesting was the return of the liberty of the commons. On this Earth Day, the elephant in the room is global warming. And it's a pretty overwhelming topic, but uh, if we Google Earth, zoom in on our little islands, then maybe we can... We can start there. Today, um, I'll be talking about the local spills uh, prevention and what we're doing in the islands, what the groups, how they've organized, what they're doing for advocacy work. Um, and then Lovell will talk to you about the meat and potatoes, the nitty gritty of the fossil fuel shipments themselves, the big picture of what's happening in our region in the Salish Sea. Um, the vessel traffic risk assessment report, which just came out recently. Um, other spill risks that aren't addressed in vessel traffic risk assessment, the Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain Pipeline, which I know the leak is aware about, um, up in Canada, and the big, big picture of climate change. And then I will speak to you about what we can, what we can do about it. We've got to take action here. Oil spills are not a new issue in our islands. The first record that we know of, of an oil spill, was reported in the Friday Harbor newspaper in July 1931. And that report said, L.G. Little and Ross Tullock, a committee of the commercial club, appeared before the council and asked that some action be taken to abate the oil nuisance on the waters of the bay. The resulting ordinance passed four months later, you can see here. Now, as far as our island groups, let's fast forward 50 years later from the 1931 ordinance. In 1985, oily birds and oil gloves were showing up on Westcott Bay, and the residents were really horrified, not just about the oily, awful mess to the birds and the, and the beach, but the fact that there was no response within 20, the crucial uh, first 24 hours. They had to come from the mainland, they couldn't get there. This group said, that's not good enough, so they formed their own group which is the Island Oils Spill Association, or IOSA. Uh, today, they have 13 equipment stations on five islands, five marine vessels, and have trained over 300 responders. It is the only organization of its kind in our state. We are really, really lucky that, that they are here. But as you'll hear later in this talk, um, you'll find out that we wish there were more of them, and we wish they were on steroids. <laughs> The San Juan's Alliance was formed um, not as a response to an actual oil spill, but in response to the threat of an oil spill in the form of the shipping that would happen if the coal terminal were to um, uh, come to fruition at uh, Cherry Point. Uh, the members of the Alliance are Lopez No Coalition, Orcas No Coalition, Friends of the San Juans, and San Juan Islanders for Safe Shipping, and some of our members are here today. The Friends of the San Juans was, sound, was founded in 1979. They are, as you know, our community's environmental watchdog. And like the watchdog at the gate, they sounded the first alarm when there's any threat to the environment over Salish Sea. And in the case of the Cherry Point Terminal, that was a big threat. So they got the word out. In the meantime, on the different islands, Lopez and Orca Snow Coalitions were forming. San Juan Islanders for Safe Shipping was forming, all in with the goal to inform and gal galvanize the community to be a part of the environmental impact statement scoping process, which is our community's opportunity to say what, we're, what issues we're concerned about of this proposed terminal. And I'll talk a little bit about the scoping um, later. Um, we did outreach by showing up at the farmer's market, by writing letters to the paper, uh, formed websites, and we were able to compile a list of over 600 islanders, that, a list that we use today for calls to action. Uh, I consider Louisa Nishitani to be the founder of the San Juan uh, 
uh, Islanders for Safe Shipping, she quietly and doggedly behind the scenes was writing her own letter to speak out to the public to say, please write a scoping, a scoping letter. She uh, copied thousands of this, and she with uh, Ann Gerald went to the various public events in the region, and they actually went to the ferry terminals, knocked on the doors of the people waiting for the ferry, and passed out these. And Louisa's got some great stories about that. Um, after the success of the scoping meetings in the fall of 2012, the various islands groups, these islands groups got together, we gave us ourselves a name, San Juan's Alliance. Uh, this is a white paper that we compiled, and I believe the League has copies of it, and if not, we'll be happy to get them to you. Um, because much attention was played, paid to the rail traffic, uh, the rail trains, the coal trains, um, on the mainland, the islanders thought, well wait, what about us? We've got ships that are going to be going around us. So we need to get a focus on the information, how to get the information about what the impacts will be. Marine specific impacts, uh, such as ship noise on humans and orcas, the aquatic invasive species in ballast water, and of course, as Sarah mentioned, the loss of our tourism economy in the event of an oil spill. Uh, after our presentation today, if you feel astonished and want to do something about it, we'd be glad to talk to you about it. becoming a member of the San Juan's Alliance. So here we are at the uh, scoping hearing meeting in November of 2012, and you might recognize some of the people in this picture. Some of you are in this picture. A little bit of background on Cherry Point. Uh, due to its deep waters along the shoreline, it's historically an ideal habitat for Pacific herring, which are now listed as a species of concern, uh, the herring are. In the year 2000, the state established nearly 300 acres of Cherry Point region as an aquatic reserve, but others see it as an irresistible location for a deep water terminal. So in 2011, permit applications were filed <clears throat> for a terminal that would ship 48 million tons of coal a year to China, and they named it the Gateway Pacific Terminal. We call it GPT for short. The um, scoping comment began, uh, the period began. We were lucky to even have a hearing here. Thanks to Lovell and her hundreds of emails, the county council did request that a scoping hearing be in San Juan County. Uh, Lovell tells me that the county council had no idea what a big deal this was until 450 people descended on all on Friday Harbor at once. Uh, the Islanders sent comments, including the San Juan County Council, and all total, there was an unprecedented number of 125,000 total comments. Then what to do after the success of our scoping? Uh, the San Juan's Alliance asked, how can we get keep people engaged? How can we keep the County Council informed? Summer was coming, we were going to have an audience of tourists and snowbirds returning, families showing up. Let's have an entry in the 4th of July parade. So, my visionary friend Lisa Michelson said, what if we had a gigantic coal ship when we marched in the parade? Okay, let's have a coal ship. So thanks to Alice Hurd and her barn and the numerous volunteers, we created a, oh, you'll see it later in the, in the fair, but a large coal ship. We were hoping at least 20 people would show up. It would take that many to carry this gigantic thing. But we had 85 people show up. We were just blown away, all wearing red. Allison is sporting her red shirt today <laughs> in solidarity. Um, and we uh, liked the fact that so many people showed up. What that showed us was that people really care. They're very concerned, and they want to do something about it. So the march was, was a really good success. That summer of the coal ship was also the summer of the Lummi, and that's when the Lummi Nation spoke out. The press covered it extensively. Uh, they were very concerned that the terminal was going to be in the land that they had been using for 175 generations. They considered it sacred ground. In this photo, they're ceremonially burning a check that is to say uh, no amount of money can buy our support. And here is the large coal ship at the, I'll use Boyd's Corner. Here's our large coal ship, and to scale, this is what a ferry would look like. These are, I'm not sure this is exactly to scale, but these are little, the little fishing vessels. That's you, that's you and your little boat out there <laughs> on the water. Um, at the fair, uh, because of the Lummi's opposition that was, had a lot of press coverage, 
and also the recently released um, scoping um, decision, which included a broad scope. We had letters for the fairgoers to sign that would said thank you both to the Lummi and to the governor and the Department of Ecology for their decision <coughs> of the broad, uh, broad <coughs> scope. And it was a lot of things that islanders had asked for, from marine traffic to emissions from burning coal in Asia. There are other coal terminals uh, planned for this region, and this is just a list of the three on the left that are still on the table. Uh, Gateway, as we know, the uh, coal terminal in Longview, and, and the one in uh, Port of Morrow in Boardman, Oregon. These are still waiting to happen. The, um, they're through with their environmental impact statements. However, the one in Boardman uh, is not going through an environmental impact statement, a less rigorous environmental assessment, waiting for a decision on that. Uh, the three terminals that were um, pulled or shelved are, was one at Grace Harbor, one at Coos Bay, Oregon, and one at Port St. Helens, Oregon. And um, uh, I'm trying to remember, I think it was the Grace Harbor one. It might have been, the, do you remember, level which one was Kinder Morgan? Well, one of these is Kinder Morgan's project. They put it aside saying that uh, they would prefer to work on some other large project, and Lovell will talk to you about, we think, what their other large project is. Some other examples of advocacy work that the San Juan's Alliance has done is we've worked at the County Council on the legislative priorities. Again, thank you to Lovell since 2010. Oil spill prevention, readiness, and response has been high on the list of the legislative priorities list on our council, for our council. Uh, but this time when it came up for a review, we wanted to make sure it stayed there and we included the words other oils and coal in anticipation of the projects that Lovell will be speaking about. And when it came time to update the comprehensive plan, we uh, suggested some verbiage, which you'll see here in yellow, words like adding economy when you talk about protection of the environment, uh, words of, uh, as such as mitigation, and we wanted to include uh, locating response equipment, beefing up response equipment and funding for it such, and making sure that it's located in the San Juan Islands. We've also encouraged the council uh, to write more letters to stay stay active. They did. Uh, they wrote a letter for the Longview Coal Terminal, a scoping letter, and they applied as commenter for the Kinder Morgan Pipeline Project in Canada, and thank you to the League for doing as well. Our 600 plus safe shippers email list, uh, as I said, we use them when it comes to call for action, and we've probably sent about a dozen, dozen such letters since then. This is a uh, a beach at Prince William Sound. Uh, this is a result of the Exxon Valdez oil spill that happened 25 years ago. Uh, in order to commemorate this not so happy event, the San Juan's Alliance hosted an informational lecture on three islands. Uh, it, we had Gary Shiganaka, a marine biologist from NOAA, and Julie Knight, the director of IOSA, come. We helped with the screening of documentary film Black Wave and uh, Friday Har Harbor Film Festival helped us with that. Lopez and Orcas No Coalitions as well. Uh, I think the League would be really interested in seeing this movie by the way. It um, ex examines the impacts to human lives. One of the viewers that had seen it said they were so used to seeing oil, pictures of oil birds that when it came to talking about the human impact they were so overwhelmed. It's quite an emotional story to hear and it also includes all the corporate shenanigans, um, the stalling and, and uh, the, the way that Exxon Valdez is wiggled out of paying their fines. Um, also at this time of the anniversary the local press did excellent coverage. There were guest opinions in the papers, there were columns, there were letters to the editor and I think it's because so many islanders had witnessed it firsthand. They were either fishers there who lost their businesses and end up being, actually we're lucky to have them here, but for a sad occasion. Um, and also a lot of scientists on the islands had gone up to Prince William Sound to do studies. Um, we see this as Prince William Sound, but we can also imagine it as what if this were our beach? What if it's Waldron Island? What if it's your favorite beach? It's not a good thing to think about, but I think it's important. Um, 
11,000 workers descended upon the beaches. It took four summers, took $2 billion. 25 years later, it's still not cleaned up. And I guess the big question is, can an oil spill ever be cleaned up? So while you ponder that question, I'll hand you over to Lovell, but I'll be back and we'll hopefully talk about more positive things like what we can do. Well, thank you, Sean. And uh, thank you to the League for having us here today. And thank you especially for giving me more than three minutes to do this presentation. <laughs> uh, yeah. I am going to go over a lot of material relatively quickly, and for anyone interested, I'm happy to send you any of the source documents, so please just contact me if you'd like uh, and more information. So I'm going to start with the big picture, and this is a graphic that, that Sean did, and what I want you to get from this presentation is an understanding of the big picture from the source of the various fossil fuels through the transport of them and ultimately to the uh, the result of them being burned. So up here in uh, uh, British Columbia, or in Alberta, in, in Canada, we've got the Alberta tar sands, which is the source for the diluted bitumen that Kinder Morgan exports. And then here we have the Bakken Shale Formation in North Dakota, Wyoming, and up into Canada, where the US crude oil that comes by rail uh, to the west coast where that comes from and then down here the Powder River Coal Basin the source of the coal uh, Sean told you about the the number of coal projects um, being proposed and then uh, we'll get a closer look at these dots over here but all of these dots represent either existing expanding or proposed coal or oil terminals or refineries and uh, so that just gives you a, a, a glimpse of the big picture. And then if you can see that green dot right there, that's us. That's the San Juan Islands. So oops, we're going to zoom in on that white box there on our, our green San Juan Islands. And you can, see, um, you can see this vessel route here that goes around the perimeter of our county. The maritime professionals refer to that as the rotary. And we'll, we'll learn more about that. So up here in Canada, uh, I referred to the Kinder Morgan terminal here that exports the diluted bitumen from up in Al Alberta. And then we have two coal terminals, existing coal terminals, the two red dots that are um, planning to expand. And then over here, the Fraser Surrey docks uh, would, is a proposed coal terminal. They would receive the coal there barge it up to Texada Island and load it there onto large cargo vessels for export. And understand that all the vessel traffic from Canada has to come down through the Georgia Strait, Boundary Pass, Harrow Strait, and out the Strait of Juan de Fuca. In the, on the U.S. side of the border, we have five Washington State refineries, and those are these purple uh, circles here. Purple because they're expanding. Our refineries are, are putting in rail uh, facilities. Three of the refineries have operational rail facilities already. BP up in Whatcom County, Tesoro and Anacortes, and US Oil down in Tacoma. And then uh, Phillips 66, which is also up in Whatcom County, is under construction. They're a rail facility. And the Shell um, refinery in Anacortes is in the permitting process. So not included in this map are the other uh, ports, the other marine facilities that um, handle container vessels and other bulk commodity uh, cargo vessels. So this is, a, this is a very busy waterway that we live in, in the middle of. This is just to give you an idea of the various large vessels that travel through our waters. Um, resources here prepared this um, comparison that's to scale. This is the Washington State Ferry, the Hayek, and this is the um, Cape Violet bulk carrier, and that's comparing them uh, in terms of the scale of their size. In this chart, we also I've also included the Panamax and Affirmax uh, vessels 
the Panamax size vessel could be used by both the Gateway uh, Coal Terminal Project and Kinder Morgan's uh, diluted bitumen uh, uh, crude oil exports. The Affirmax would be used by the Kinder Morgan Project. Again, uh, this is an example of the size of a bulk carrier that would transport coal. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit about container ships, and this is an example of one particular container ship that set a record down in the Port of Tacoma uh, last year. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the history of oil spills in this region. We've actually been very fortunate that in almost 20 years we haven't had a major oil spill uh, in the waters around uh, this area. A major oil spill is defined in Washington State as a spill of over 10,000 gallons. And we're fortunate to have some of the best uh, spill response professionals, the best spill agencies um, really in the nation. We're really very fortunate. Um, this is a slide up here that was from a old, uh, the 2010 Department of Ecology presentation. And I just want to read the, the, the last line here. Less than one gallon of oil is spilled for every 100 million <coughs> gallons transferred. So really, we have a lot to be proud about regarding oil spill prevention and the management of risk in our waterways, but we cannot get complacent. We have had major oil spills in the past. In 1988, there was an oil barge that capsized in Guaymas Channel, <coughs> spilling 70,000 gallons of heavy fuel. And in 94, there was a grounding near Anacortes where almost 27,000 gallons of diesel was spilled. And these are pictures from a 1985 spill in Port Angeles. The Arco Anchorage, a single hull tanker, uh, ran aground in the Port Angeles Harbor and they are spilling 239,000 gallons of crude oil. And this picture in the upper left, I want to be sure you can, you can see what that's a picture of. That's a wildlife rescue station that was set up in the high school and those people are washing oiled birds. And um, at that time there wasn't a, a requirement for people who wanted to volunteer and with rescued wildlife in the event of an oil spill, there wasn't the requirement that you have to have training first. Now there is. You have an opportunity to, uh, through IOSA, to get the training if you, if you would want to be a, a wildlife rescue volunteer in the event of a major spill. So now I'm going to talk about um, the vessel traffic risk assessment. And this is going to be a very brief summary, but it, it's a really important study, and I think we should all be aware of it and be sure that this isn't a study that just gets shelled. So um, the Vessel Traffic Risk Assessment was just completed on March 31st. The authors are Professors Renee Van Dork from George Washington University and Jason Merrick from the Virginia Commonwealth University. And this is a study that analyzes vessel traffic. So the interaction of boats with each other and uh, a lot of actual data, the geography, marine facilities, tides, current weather, and then it analyzes the risk of potential accidents and oil spills. So the purpose of the study is to inform the state and the Coast Guard and the Puget Sound Harbor Safety Committee on what actions could be taken to mitigate increases in oil spill risk. So this is a maritime simulation model and it's a model that represents the chain of events that could potentially lead to an oil spill. So we take, uh, the study takes the 2010 actual vessel data for the entire year, and that is the base case. And it takes not only the vessel data, but all the actual data, you know, like I said, the, the tides, the currents, the weather, all of that, and it includes in the model um, and so that's, that's the 2010 base case. And then the study focuses on what they call the focus vessels, oil tankers, chemical carriers, oil barges, tug barges, bulk carriers, container ships, and cargo vessels. And it analyzes um, the potential uh, risks of collisions, uh, of accidents and oil loss for these particular vessels. But the study analyzes the interaction of these focus vessels with all the vessels. So I, I included this, um, I just want to point out a few things. This is just a, a, a graphic from the study itself, and I just want to point out 
a lot of the detail here. You can see uh, this is Blakely Island and Decatur, and the south end of Lopez is here. And these green arrows that you can see probably are tankers. And what you may not be able to see are a lot of much smaller. There are several gray areas that are fishing vessels and other small vessels all interacting uh, in this model. So it's got a lot of detail and it's geographically specific. Whoops. And then it took the 2010 base case and it added the additional vessel traffic from these proposed projects. So it includes the Gateway Pacific Terminal Project and additional 487 bulk carriers. And it also includes the bunkering uh, vessels in this study. And bunkering is where um, uh, one ship brings propulsion through fuel and loads it onto another ship. So the, this would be the 228 bunkering supply transits that are what's needed to supply propulsion fuel to those bulk carriers. So that it's very important. You'll see later that that's included in the study. So also included in the study is the Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain Pipeline Expansion Project. And then the third um, group is a compilation of several projects uh, proposed to increase up in British Columbia. And again, note that these two projects here, Kinder Morgans and the compilation project from British Columbia, all of this traffic comes down through the Strait of Georgia, Boundary Pass, and Harrow Strait. Uh, so on the west side of this island. So this is actually the study area outlined in black, okay? It's this entire area here. And just to get orientated, here's San Juan County here in the center. Can you see San Juan Island? Yeah. Okay, just to get you oriented. So the waterways are all colored and the lands are in beige. And as I said, this is a, a, a geographically specific uh, relative risk analysis. So the vessel traffic risk assessment analyzes relative risk across the entire study area and then also within each of these waterway zones. So we're going to focus on oil loss, potential oil loss. So if you take the 2010 base case, that represents 100% of potential oil loss. And then when you add all the additional um, potential vessels from the three projects, if you add them all to the 2010 base case, there's an increase in potential oil loss in the entire study area by a plus 68%. But remember, this study looks at the relative um, changes in risk over the entire study area and also by the specific waterway zones. So now we're going to look at the relative changes in risk for the waterway zones that surround San Juan County. And we'll start down here in the east strait of Juan de Fuca. And so there's an increase, a relative increase in risk in that waterway zone of 142 percent. We go up to Rosario and it's just an increase of 3 percent. But what's important to understand is that in the original 2010 base case, almost 15 percent of the total risk was in the Rosario waterway zone, which makes sense when you think about how that's a narrow channel and, and all the refineries that are located near there. And so the increase wasn't uh, that much in that waterway zone. Up here in Georgia Strait, the increase is 81 percent. And then over here in Harrow Strait and Boundary Pass, that's the big change in, in the increase in risk, 375 percent. Is that in four years? That's taking 2010, the actual vessel traffic in 2010, and adding the vessel traffic from the proposed projects, Gateways Project, Kinder Morgan's Project, and then a compilation of increased projects from uh, British Columbia. In four years? No. no, it's just if those projects are approved. We don't know what the timeline would be, when they would be approved, if they would be approved, if they were approved. You, okay, go ahead. Well, this, this is, you're, you're talking about percent risk. Yes. Increased risk. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, so. Yeah. So this is another graphic from the Vessel Traffic Risk Assessment that I think helps illustrate the increase in risk better. So this is a three-dimensional geographic profile. And this is the 2010 base case. And remember how I talked about how a high percentage of the risk is in the Rosario waterway 
also in the Guamus waterway. And just to orient you, the blue is the water, and it's raised. And can you see San Juan Island right there? Okay, so just to get reference, it's a little hard to read at first. But remember, this is a geographic specific depiction of the risk. So here we are in 2010, and this is what would happen if those three projects were all approved, and we had that increase in risk. That's 2010, and these are with the three additional projects. And you can see a lot of the increase in risk is Harrow Strait, Boundary Pass in there. I'll just do this one more time. And the risk is from the increased vessel traffic. There's no other factor in that determination. Is that correct? That's correct. So if you recall, now maybe you have a better understanding of the rotary. We are at the center of uh, a lot of vessel traffic around the perimeter of San Juan County. We already have the risk of a major spill. And with the increasing uh, vessel traffic, that, spill, that risk of a major spill goes up significantly. So then the vessel traffic risk assessment looked at uh, risk mitigation measures and it analyzed six of them. And certainly there are others that could also be analyzed as well, but this was, these six were included in the study. So the first one was to reduce the maximum speed of container vessels to 17 knots. And many container vessels are already doing that in an effort to save money on fuel costs. Um, but that was a risk mitigation measure applied to the study. The second one was to reduce human error by 50%, and that would be accomplished by having uh, one more person on the bridge of oil barges. And this is actually a risk mitigation measure that's being considered as a requirement for one more person on uh, the bridge of oil barges in U.S. waters. Uh, the third risk mitigation measure, no bunkering for gateway vessels. We'll talk more about that in the next slide. The fourth risk mitigation measure would um, require that the Rosario one-way regime, regime apply to uh, articulate, articulated tug barges. So the Rosario one-way regime is already in practice now for many large vessels. And it's not that in Rosario Strait you either can go only north or only south. It's just that when large vessels go through that strait, they can't cross paths with another large vessel. So traffic is managed to only allow vessels through going in one direction at a time, the large vessels. Uh, is this traffic managed by Seattle uh, uh, traffic system? Or is it a separate management? Um, you know, it's CETOS and I'm, um, it, you know, I, I'll have to get back to you. I don't know the answer to that right off. Um, and then the fifth and sixth risk mitigation measures are providing an additional escort um, in the uh, Harrow Strait and the Harrow Strait and, and the Boundary Pass and through Rosario in these orange and green areas. So getting back to risk mitigation measure number three, um, I'm sure that many of you here are members of the San Juan Preservation Trust, and many of us remember when the Preservation Trust was able to purchase Vendovi Island. And this was a major conservation accomplishment, preserving in perpetuity this island that's been in single ownership forever and is, uh, to a large degree, incredibly pristine. Um, so Vendovi Island actually has anchorages for five vessels uh, surrounding the island, two published anchorage areas. And uh, the Gateway Pacific Terminal application specifically does not provide for bunkering at the Gateway Terminal at the dock. And so the question was, where would the bunkering take place? And the Vessel Traffic Risk Assessment Steering Committee, the marine professionals who were represented there, said likely they do the bunkering at Vendovi, at the Vendovi anchorages. And that's how um, it was modeled. They determined that 47% of those bulk uh, carry cargo carriers would require bunkering, and, and so they modeled that in the study. And then they noticed that that bunkering traffic itself generated uh, quite a bit of risk. So one of the risk mitigation measures was just to remove it. And, and it did indeed, when analyzing just the gateway traffic, it did indeed have a dramatic result, reducing accident frequency in the entire study area by 6%. 
and oil loss reduction in the entire study area by 10%. Um, so, so if all six risk mitigation measures are applied to the 2010 base case plus all the additional vessel traffic, there's a 44% reduction in oil loss. And I just want you to look here, this bar graph, I know it's hard to read, but just at the very top, if you look at the top red line and the top blue line, this blue line represents the risk of oil loss in the Harrow Strait Boundary Pass waterway zone. And then look how much it's reduced with all six risk mitigation measures applied. It has the most dramatic uh, effect in that particular waterway zone. And then when, it, when this um, all six risk mitigation measures are applied, um, the reduction in uh, accident frequency is, it's, this is an even more dramatic result because it's reduced to the point that it goes down below what the risk was in the 2010 base case, even with all that additional vessel traffic. So as I said, now this study's done, and I hope it doesn't get shelved. This is uh, finding number seven, that even if the three proposed projects aren't permitted and don't um, actually um, go into effect, you know, there's reason to implement some of these risk mitigation measures because of the, um, the way that they benefit the system even as it exists today. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about what's not included in the vessel traffic risk assessment. And the first thing, you know, we, we, we talked about bunkering traffic and how that can be impactful. So I just want to point out this, these three blue circles here. That's Grays Harbor, where there are three applications for oil terminals there. And then here in the Columbia River, there's a number of applications for coal terminals, oil terminals. And the question is, where would those vessels get their bunkering from? Where um, would they either, would those large vessels actually go into our waterways to receive propulsion fuel? Would, would barges or other types of vessel transport the propulsion fuel to them? That in itself would generate vessel traffic, additional vessel traffic, and that's not studied in the vessel traffic risk assessment. Also not included in the vessel traffic risk assessment are spills from derelict vessels. This was in 2012, the sinking of the deep sea in Penn Cove. You're probably all familiar with Penn Cove mussels. These are the Penn Cove mussel rafts that you can see out in the water here. And this here, it's a little hard to read, but this circle of red is boom surrounding the site of where the, the ship went down. But you can see it did not uh, successfully contain the spill. You can see the sheen on the water going outside of the boom area. This was an incredibly expensive spill to clean up, four and a half million dollars. And I've included in that total cost the cost to Penn Cove shellfish for revenue losses. The Washington State Department of Health closed them down for 22 days, and that amounted to a loss of revenue of over $1.2 million. The cost to the state um, ecology department was over $1.6 million, and the cost to um, Washington State's Department of Natural Resources, their derelict vessel program, was over $1.2 million. And that doesn't include their ongoing costs um, associated with the legal charges that DNR has referred against the owner of this ship in Island County criminal misdemeanor case. So uh, the responsible party has not stepped up to be responsible and pay the cost of this spill. And fortunately, we have the Federal Oil Spill Liability Trust Fund, and that reimbursed the state over $1.5 million for the cost of the cleanup. And this is a fund that's funded in part with an eight cents per barrel excise tax on all petroleum and crude products. And we're very fortunate to have that fund because it's not always that the responsible party will pay the cost of the cleanup. And it's an incredible burden on states and the Coast Guard in these situations. Mm -hmm. Another thing not included in the vessel traffic risk assessment are spills from marine facilities when it's not the result of one of the focus vessels you know, hitting the dock or what have you. This was a, a spill that happened in February 2,000 gallons of oily bilge water um, was discharged at a naval base, Kitsap Banger. And this is an aerial photo of the Hood Canal Bridge, and you can see the sheen on the water of that spill, uh, which traveled 10 miles. 
And finally, what's not included in the vessel traffic risk assessment is potentially increases in vessel traffic from our refineries. Again, we've got U.S. oil down in Tacoma, Shell in Tesoro and Anacortes, and BP and Phillips 66 up in, up in Whatcom County, north of Bellingham. And as I said, these facilities are in the process. They either have operational rail facilities or in the process of getting them. And um, one thing that's true is that the number of tankers delivering crude oil to our refineries from Alaska has gone down. Um, and so there's, folks are saying that the crude received by rail could in fact offset the crude that had been received from Alaska and decrease the tanker traffic uh, to our refineries. But my concern is that our refineries will be used to um, receive crude by rail or pipeline. Oh, you know, I should go back a minute here. So the four northern refineries, um, they, they receive Canadian diluted bitumen crude oil by pipeline. Okay, so that's important to know. And so um, my concern is that there'll be an increase of the number of times crude is loaded as cargo onto vessels. And this is um, from the Department of Ecology. And you can see in 2009, this took place just one time. In 2010, twice. 2011, three times. And now 2012 is when the rail facilities start becoming operational. That took place 21 times. And in 2013, just January to September, and this is the most recent data I have, 31 times. So the concern is that we could have additional vessel traffic from the refineries transporting crude as cargo that they receive either by rail or by pipeline. And um, I brought this up. Some of you were at the town hall meeting uh, last week or week before last that our representatives Chris Litton and Jeff Morris had here on San Juan Island. And I, I brought this up and, and Jeff Morrison said that, that he thought that the Magnuson Amendment would prevent this. And um, this was Senator Magnuson, a wonderful champion of Puget Sound, introduced this amendment in 1977. And it appears that it would um, uh, prohibit these refineries from, from um, increasing vessel traffic this way. But uh, that remains to be seen. We'll have to follow up with Jeff. So um, just a reminder of this crude that um, the refineries are receiving by rail from the Bakken Shale Formation here. And we're going to see a, um, <coughs> we're going to see a um, time lapse history of Bakken Shale production in the U.S. from 1985 to 2010. And you can see the years click by in the top right. You can watch this graph here in the bottom left. And about 2003, 2004, the production really ramps up. You can just see that visually happening. But I want you to also know that this is just the, the um, shale production going on on the U.S. side of the border. And the Bakken uh, formation extends up into Canada. So potentially one concern is that the refineries could be receiving Canadian crude from the Bakken formation uh, from uh, up in Canada here. 71% of the crude from this uh, Bakken shell formation is transported by rail. And this is a graph showing the exponential growth of crude uh, by rail starting in 2005 up through 2013. Okay, um, now we're going to go back to the big picture. I know that in the vessel traffic risk assessment, it did include the increased vessel traffic from the Kinder Morgan project, but I want to go back and look at that again because there's real concerns about the particular product that they would be exporting. So here again, we're up in uh, the Alberta tar sands where the bitumen is mined. This is a chart showing uh, the history and the growth, the projected growth of Alberta bitumen production through 2022. Here's a picture of a, a surface mine. This is up in the boreal forest there. So the bitumen is mined and then it's diluted so that it can travel through a pipeline. And this is the pipeline that starts up in Edmonton. 
And the black line is what's currently uh, the current pipeline where they're receiving the current product from. And the Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain Pipeline Expansion Project proposes to twin the pipeline in order to increase their exports. And so that's the blue or colored line. And then this is their Westridge terminal down in Burnaby, just outside of Vancouver, where they would expand the terminal facility. This is a conceptual drawing. And here we see the terminal itself and one of the Aframax tankers that they use to transport the diluted bitumen crude oil. And again, they would be increasing the tanker traffic. Currently, they're um, about 60 tankers a year or 120 transits a year transporting the diluted bitumen. And they would propose to increase that amount to 408 annual tankers or 816 transits by 2016. So at this time, um, you've received this handout, and I just want to draw your attention to the handout just briefly, and just let you know that this is um, these are actual pages from the Kinder Morgan application that was submitted, and I just want to point out that the these um, simulations, these oil spill studies that you see uh, here. The amounts that are included in these studies are either 104,000 barrels, which is identified as the credible worst case size oil spill, or 52,000 barrels, which is identified as the mean case spill size. And note that these Aframax tankers, um, the Kinder Morgan application says they carry 650,000 barrels. Um, but I, elsewhere I've seen that um, at 750. So again, just going back to the vessel traffic risk assessment study, the risk today and the risk as it would be if those three projects are all permitted and, and that additional vessel traffic is added. So diluted bitumen is, um, is unlike crude oil in that it's very problematic to clean up. So this was a spill that took place in 2010, and you may not have heard about it because it happened when the BP Deepwater Horizon spill was going on, and that just eclipsed the news in terms of oil spills. So many people weren't really aware of this spill um, that happened up in the Kalamazoo River. It was a pipeline spill, and it's still not cleaned up almost four years later. And as of last summer, the cost to date was almost a billion dollars, and that's $50,000 per barrel. Now, up until this spill, the average cost of an oil spill cleanup was $2,000 per barrel. Um, and the, the spill, the, even the BP Horizon spill, wasn't all that much more. It was either, depending on how you calculated, it was either $2,800 per barrel or $6,400 per barrel. So this $50,000 per barrel should just make it clear to you, this is an exorbitantly expensive product to clean up, if it even can be. And we can't talk about oil spills without giving a shout out to our Senator Cantwell. She is just such a champion on this issue and we're so fortunate to have her in Congress. And this is a press release that went out from her office last week. And even the U.S. Coast Guard, on the record, before Congress, will say that technology is lacking to clean up tar sand spills, to clean up diluted bitumen spills. I mean, that's incredible. Oops, and then I wanted to say, so we've talked about the Kinder Morgan project, and you know, now Canada has a different process when they receive an application for a project. In the US, if there's an application, it's like you all come and comment. Everybody can comment, anyone can comment. In Canada, you have to apply to comment. And thankfully, some of us in this community did, including the League of Women Voters, and they were granted commenter status by Canada's National Energy Board. So congratulations. And I really hope that National says yes, go ahead, send in those comments, because it's really important that we have a voice. And others of us in the community also were able to, to comment on this issue. One last thing about diluted bitumen. In 2011, the IRS determined that it is not an oil, and it's not subject to the excise tax that funds our oil spill liability trust fund. So we've got to do something about this. 
Um, there is a Tax Reform Act of 2014 uh, proposal. I don't know anything about this um, act as a whole, but Section 7002 is great, mm -hmm. and it would modify the definition of crude oil and petroleum products so that it includes the bitumen products. Mm -hmm. So this, you know, we somehow have to address this and, and to make sure that this product pays into that oil spill liability trust fund. And then a recap of the 2014 legislative session from the perspective of oil spill legislation. Unfortunately, nothing was passed. Even this House Bill 2440 that was put forward by the Department of Ecology just to change the definition of oil so that it included bitumen, just a very you know, straightforward, incredibly important bill, that didn't get passed. So hopefully in 2015 there will be more impetus. All of us will speak up about the importance of this legislation and um, the state will get something more done. So in 2012, there was an update to our oil spill contingency plan, and the state estimates that if we have a major oil spill, it's going to cost us 165,000 jobs and 10.8 billion in economic activity every year. And that's huge. And it's even huger when you realize that that amount doesn't include any losses to the value of property, either private property or public property. And that's a really important issue that we need to um, definitely address in commenting about the Kinder Morgan project and on oil spills issues in general. Our neighbors up in Canada are more active on this issue. This is from a handout put out by the Conversations for Responsible Economic Development, a group, um, CRED. And uh, you probably can't read it here, but this publication documents oil spill impacts to property values with properties that are directly impacted losing 10 to 40 percent of their value. And even properties that are not directly affected are seeing losses in value just by association. And it's important to understand that, that if there were to be a major oil spill and there were to be a loss in assessed value of properties, it would not change the amount of tax collected by the state or the county. <laughs> Either your, if your property is impacted by an oil spill, either your millage rate would go up or there would be a tax shift. And properties that are inland or maybe islands that are unaffected, those property owners would have to pay more. And then uh, I'm going to close on, on climate change. And I'm really delighted that the League is currently focusing on climate change. And so I included this graph here. Uh, this bar graph. So over here on the left, these are the current CO2 emissions from the Kinder Morgan project, their current exports. And this center bar graph would be what the CO2 emissions would be if their expansion project is approved. And then on the right, these, this would be the CO2 emissions from the Gateway Pacific Terminal. And a thanks to Eric DePlace with Sightline, who um, I used the same calculations he did. And he's going to be updating his uh, report to be more comprehensive um, this summer. So we should look for that. And finally, you probably have heard about the Climate Legislative and Executive <coughs> Work Group. Um, back in 2008, there was a law um, created to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in Washington state with a very ambitious goal that by 2020 we reduce our overall emissions of greenhouse gases to 1990 levels. So this work group met and during this legislative session and made recommendations. But my question is, uh, should Washington State provide permits to terminals that transport fossil fuels when uh, we will have the same uh, climate change impacts, these CO2 emissions, even if, even if the fossil fuels aren't burned in Washington State and they're burned in Asia, we still have the impacts from those uh, fossil fuel emissions. We still have impacts to uh, the climate change, to sea level rise, to ocean acidification. And just to take one piece, just looking at ocean acidification, uh, former Governor Gregoire issued an executive order on ocean acidification. And in that, it says that Washington State's shellfish industry employs directly and indirectly 3,200 people 
and provides an annual total economic contribution of 270 million statewide. And ocean acidification, even you know, from fossil fuels burned in Asia, comes back to affect our waters and our shellfish here. So in closing, um, <laughs> in closing, uh, Sean told me that I had to, to say why I'm still involved in these issues. I'm no longer on the county council. Um, but when I was elected back in 2008, I very quickly realized that the biggest threat to both our environment and our economy is the threat of a major oil spill. And this was a really important issue that, that needed my attention and something that I had to to focus on, um, among all the other things you have to focus on while you're on the council. But I quickly became appointed to several state and regional committees, as Sarah said. And when I left the council, none of the current council members decided to um, take up that focus and were not attending those meetings. So I decided that I better still attend. And so I've, you know, so far I haven't stopped going to the vessel traffic risk assessment meetings or the oil spill work group meetings. Because even as a citizen, I feel like it's important to speak up and, um, you know, to give voice to these issues. And so that's, you know, and, and I'm here today to implore all of us to do that. You know, uh, all the issues, you know, the big picture of, of the fossil fuels from where they're mined or drilled and all the transport to wherever they're burned, these are all big issues. But we as islanders, whether we're visitors or we're residents, we need to speak up for our waterways. Uh, we need to oppose projects that don't guarantee to mitigate all, all the potential adverse impacts. And we need to advocate for shipping safety and appropriate spill response capacity, for financial guarantees that address the full cost of cleanup and restitution. And now I'm going to turn it over to Sean to talk in more detail about what we can do. Thank you, Lovell. See, I told her she was a walking Wikipedia. Um, so, were you paying attention? Are you astonished? Do you want to tell about it? So let's talk about what we can do in our little corner of the world. Um, handouts are being handed out. It's going to be short. Well, okay, we, we will get more of the information to you. There's, this is just a synopsis, um, minus the contact information of websites and emails and phone numbers. Um, one of the first things that we can do is learn about um, where, how and what and where will be protected through the geographic response plan. And again, the website, the contact website is on there. Um, there are various locations that have been um, highlighted as very important to protect. You, um, there's a map when you go to the website. You may find that your beach or your favorite beach, your beach you own, one you love, somebody, somebody's beach is not protected enough or protected at all, you, if, even if you have a question. That's what we want to do. We want to have questions we want to ask. So we contact our governor and we contact the U.S. Coast Guard. We ask for improved prevention and equipment personnel and training. And we need uh, response equipment here on the islands. Um, as far as the diluted bitumen that Lovell talked about, please contact state and federal representatives. Um, ask them to put those laws into place. Um, advocate for just better protection all around the laws that will, that will do that. Um, you, we as islanders can join the um, Islands Oil Spills Association as trained volunteers. You can offer money, you can offer time, you can offer your shoreline property for access so that they can have, they have a place to put the equipment and deploy, deploy what they do have. Um, the San Juan County Council also applied for um, commenter, commenter status on the Kinder Morgan pipeline, so please say yes whenever they do something that goes in the direction of greater protection. Please say yes to them. Uh, they like to hear yeses now and then. <laughs> uh, the, you may have heard about the Friends of the San Juans did a drift card drop um, in two different locations. The drift cards are showing up. You can report them and see on the map. And again, that website is on the handout. Uh, the map shows where they've been found, and it's very, very interesting seeing that the current can take those maps. In one, in one case, I saw it went all the way around. It was dropped way up here, it went all the way around, and was found up here. So 
Um, I'm assuming that's the direction it went. Um, anyway, that's that's pretty amazing. I think there's still uh, Janet. Do you know how many are still left to be found? I think about half. About half of them. Okay. All right. Um, and we would love your ideas. When the league gets really immersed in this climate change issue, and you do more studies and more talks, um, uh, we like some help with engaging the public, uh, getting word out in the local papers, again, talking to the council that um, and I mentioned, how do we mentor our youth? How do we get the schools involved? Uh, just to keep the, the word out there. Our, our local paper has been discussing it. You may have seen the cartoon from last week's yes. um, issue. This is the, sa the ship is called the Salish Sea Coal and Oil Shipping. And the captain is asking, turn this around or stopping it, not asking, saying, turning this around or stopping it isn't easy. Literally, those ships, no. Really, really, it takes miles for them to stop. Turning around, nearly impossible. As far as the actual shipment and the industry, can we stop them? We don't know, but I think we should try, and I think we should keep asking, at least insist for as much protection as we can get. We. Um, we th I think we can do this as islanders. This is very important, as Lovell was talking about. Uh, the waterways belong to us. We need to insist on their protection. And so we leave you with these quotes. And you can mull those over a little bit. And uh, thank you, thank you to the League for inviting us here today. And if you're really astonished, maybe too astonished to ask questions, but we hope you do. So please ask away. Instructions for living a life. Pay attention, be astonished, and tell about it. Questions? Yes. Um, when they were trying to um, assess the economic value or impact, has anybody tried to assess the impact on our recreational uh, boating and fishing? and on our loss of endangered species. So in terms of the, that quote that you saw on the impact of Washington State, that's from the cost benefit and least burdensome alternative analysis from the 2012 update to the oil spill contingency plan. And they do include um, the loss of revenue from recreational related activity. Um, and I can, I can provide you with that study. And they do um, go into an analysis of damage to um, wildlife and environment. Um, there's a process for that. But I was surprised to realize that it didn't include a loss to the losses to property values. But I, I can send you that. In species, you asked about species. Endangered species. Yes. You know, one thing I asked for when we were doing that was that they actually quantify the value of an orca whale. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you can do this. I mean, yes. you can see what SeaWorld pays for them. Okay, it's what, a million dollars or whatever. And you can assign that value to each of our orca whale that are still alive. And, and that could justify increases in uh, spill response capacity. And that was not successful. Yeah, well, could you stand over here? With your okay. Sorry. Against the light. Is this better? Thanks. Um, yes. Um, the mitigation that the measures you mentioned was not having the bunkering off of that Dolby Island. Right. So where are they going to bunker? So where would they bunker? Good question. So um, I think that a number of people will say that we need to do more analysis using the vessel traffic risk assessment. And I support that, although we could study this forever. Um, and one thing that would need to happen if it was, if bunkering would be allowed at all, I mean, one thing they could say is, you can't bunker here. You're going to have to, you know, get enough fuel. I mean, I don't know. They could, they could make that decision. But another likely place, um, <laughs> one thing that was mentioned was, well, what about Port Angeles? And everybody said, oh, no, they'd be all up in arms if it was Port Angeles. I said, well, what about Bendovi? You know, anyways. I mean, it has to be done. It, yeah, you're right. And so where would it be done? Jeff? Well, I'll make a question instead of a statement. Why don't you include the, uh, every ship running up and down the state straits, whether it's a tanker, a passenger ship, a car carrier, log ship, every single ship carries bunker fuel. Bunker fuel is almost as nasty as crude. And there's nothing to say that a tanker will necessarily go aground it might T-bone 
a log ship, and that log ship will spew bunker fuel. And every one of these large ships, container ships, carries literally hundreds of thousands of gallons of bunker fuel. And right. I've, I've cleaned some up, and it's horrific. So the vessel traffic risk assessment did include an analysis of oil loss for propulsion fuel, as well as fuel cargo, or, you know, like the, the crude oil cargo. It did include that, and it did include container all container ships as focused vessels. So that was included in the study. Yes. Um, I, I have a question about uh, outreach. Uh -huh. If there's a plan, uh, or if a plan can be made over the summer to reach out through the business community to the community of, of island visitors. I believe we have, what, 16,000 people living here, and there's about three quarters of a million visitors that come here every year who, who are, love this place at least as much as, as the people who live here. So um, that that's a much greater base of, of people. And uh, and also the other, the other thing I thought about is I hear a lot about mitigating it or slowing it down or whatever, and what strategy is to stop it entirely? Stop all oil shipping in the, the Salish Sea. And we have to think, I think we have to think about how to, how to implement a plan that, that would really solve the problem. You want to talk about outreach? Well, yes, outreach first. Um, we're taking any suggestions. That's why I, I asked. And uh, the same thing. You're right. The summer's coming, and we've got an audience, and that's what we said last year too. And that's why we did our big coal ship and the parade, and then it segued into the fair. So if we can think of something that big and impactful and important again, that would be great. So all ideas, all hands on deck on this, would be great. And then in, in terms of. of you know, as I said, I think we need to oppose all projects where they don't provide guarantees to mitigate all potential um, uh, adverse impacts. It, I mean, that's really important, and that's a very high bar to set, um, especially with regard to diluted bitumen, where, you know, even uh, the U.S. Coast Guard Vice Admiral, on the record, will say, uh, we don't have the technology to clean that stuff up. And, um, but in terms of stopping what's already happening, so like, you know, there are an average of 60 um, ships exporting diluted bitumen from uh, Kinder Morgan each year already. You know, I, I think it would be, I mean, I think the, the only thing that would stop it is if there was no demand for it, if they couldn't sell it. I mean, that would be the ultimate answer. Um, I think it's, it's incredibly difficult uh, I think we have more opportunity to stop a new project proposal from being permitted, like the Gateway Project, than we do having a project that's already in place and has applied to expand. That's a much lower threshold to get through what you are required to do to just expand what you already have. I mean, you look at the rail facilities for the, for the uh, refineries, they got mitigated determinations of non-significance in their applications, and it just happened um, way too easily. Um, but if mitigation is onerous enough, that will hit them in, at their bottom line. Right, and I think that's important, that they have to be able to include in their business model the real costs of doing business, and that includes uh, dealing with whatever mitigation would be required in the event of a spill. Right. Well, I mean, setting a goal of what we would really honestly love to see in our hearts and what would truly protect the, the sea and the islands would make any mitigation seem moderate. Yeah. Right. Betsy? <laughs> <laughs> um, two things. I guess uh, we have a real dearth of pubs that can respond to any vessel spill, but are we assuming that with these huge sized violet tankers, there, there just is no way that tugs could even respond to a ship of that size? So we do have spill response capacity. Uh, you know, the, those large vessels are required to have an emergency plan for, you know, if there is a spill, how uh, professional, professional responders would respond to clean up. Um, but 
you know, the reality of what gets cleaned up in the event of a spill, I, I don't remember off the top of my head what, like for example, that spill in Port Angeles, you know, sometimes if you can clean up 20 or 30 percent, that's really good. So um, that is one of the real problems about a spill response. In the Kinder Morgan application, they're, um, they're, in their application, they're saying that we should have stricter requirements for spill response preparedness, have additional skimmers, and other types of, of spill response equipment available. But Janet? But can the, the rescue tugs actually handle one of these enormous ships? And oh, you mean can the can rescue tugs actually, you know, maybe Jeff could better answer that question. We do have the rescue tug at Nia Bay. Tug, tugs are very powerful, but they're very slow. Right. And so transit time from where they, they are to getting to the disaster is the first problem. Right. Second problem is the lines that these tugs have weigh thousands and thousands of pounds. And you have at most 21 men on these ships. And some of those men are in the engine room, some in the sewers department. So you have a very small deck department. So you don't have the physical capability handle these lines, and then the tugs are not all equipped to handle these huge lines. A lot of the tugs here are only tow tugs for towing barges or lumber rafts. A lot of the tugs are meant for much smaller ships. So there just isn't the manpower, the expertise to handle this. When they say there's tugs all over the sound, a tug that's pull, pulling a raft is not going to let go of his, his assigned piece of equipment and go try to help somebody else. And the ones that that are available are going to take forever to get there, and when they get there, they can push if they can get around the proper direction to push. But there's no, you can't secure lines on a tug without the proper manpower, and most of these ships don't have a lot of manpower to deal with this. In fact, all of them. The ship I, the 850-foot container ship I was on, we had 21 men. There's no way we can handle stuff by ourselves, and most of those men are not on deck. So we, the, and with the one rescue tug that we have in this region is out at New Bay, mm -hmm. and we really need another one that's um, going to be a long time getting here. Yeah. 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 Laura Joe? That was one of the things about the prospect of getting another rescue tug. Um, secondly, um, last year at a conference, I talked with the captain of the Coast Guard in Seattle, and he said their cuts have been so strong that many times the danger to their own personnel is not great. And yeah. I think that that might be something requesting for an increase in the number of people, you know, the funding for Coast Guard, because we're expecting them to do a great many things here. And then thirdly, I hate to ask a complete of women voters this, but IOSA has their semi-annual drill on May the 17th, and I bring food, and I certainly would like some volunteers to get with me and I'll, I'll assign you some, some sandwich duty or something. I also, my husband and I also go out on the boats and work, but that's mainly my, my contribution. Okay, we'll see you later go after the meeting if you can help with food for us. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I, I was just wondering that the data you were saying that was used for the vessel traffic assessment was in 2010. Right. So that's been four years. Right. And, I'm so the study was started in 2011. So in that period of time, has traffic changed, either increased or decreased, or the type of vessels in that number changed? You know, off the top of my head, I can't tell you, but there is an annual report that Ecology puts out on the total number of vessel transits. And I'll get that to you, like the last four years. I'm, and I'm, I, I think it's gone up, but not I'm, I'm wondering because I live on Carroll Strait. I lived on Carroll Strait for 20 years, and just in the past six months or so, I've noticed <clears throat> a higher frequency of smaller tanker like okay. vessels coming in and out. Some actually going outbound with tugs on the Carroll Strait, which I've never, I've never seen. That. So I don't know what's in them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can you say a word about how Canadian? Vessels going to and from Canada fall under or don't fall under U.S. ideas, laws, double hulls, low sulfur fuel, yeah. those sorts of things. You know, there is, uh, back in, I think it was the 2010 U.S. Coast Guard Authorization Act, it was either 2010 or 2012, 
there was a provision in there that Senator Cantwell um, if, uh, had included in there, which required a comparability analysis <coughs> between the U.S. and Canada, just to identify uh, those sorts of things. And uh, and uh, in either, you know, it's been too long, whether it was 2010 or 2012, that hasn't been completed yet, and it's underway. And that would that would answer a lot of what you're asking. So I don't know. Uh, a question of jurisdiction. Uh, if, if a spill happens in our area of concern, and if a ship has its own containment plan, is there a situation where if the Coast Guard maybe responds, they're told to stand down because the ship has their own crew doing stuff, and there's, an ex there's a cost here? That's, that's my question. Yeah, so there is actually going to be a drill on June 6th um, between uh, the U.S. and Canada, and they're really trying to coordinate their efforts so that they can effectively respond to a spill that crosses the border, whether it's a spill that originates in Canada and comes over to the U.S. or originates in the U.S. and goes over into Canada. It's, um, it, it is, that is a complicated issue, and, and, and that's something that they're trying to uh, be better prepared for, but um, I I don't know enough to answer that question specifically. So, Beverly, uh, change the subject. There are a couple of three people who need to catch the ferry, and I wonder if anybody is driving that way. Claire is. Yeah, um, and you're okay. It's one thirty, so yeah, according to that clock. Like so yeah, but we we'll, we will get. How many people need a ride to the 220 ferry? Okay. Yeah. I'll get you there. Good. Okay. I was um, talking to a fellow in Kalamazoo, and he recommended investing in pipelines because they were the highest rate of return, which I thought was ironic because he lives in Kalamazoo. And hearing today that they don't pay excise taxes, that would be one increase on investment. And at the same time, at the Port of Friday Harbor, I've just been charged a 13% dinghy or tax for having my dinghy on the water. And so I'm thinking if you add excise tax to the equivalent for the right to use the water, these pipeline companies are getting a free ride <laughs> and Bingo. at our expense. And they're using our resources, the water, to hold up the boats and et cetera. And then the other aspect of the question that I have that's not so much related to spill, but there's lots of small boat traffic. What happens? I mean, if, if Washington State Ferries can run over a sloop that's 28 feet or 26 feet long in the middle of the day, which they did fairly recently, um, what's going to happen to the kayakers, the small boats? And we used to cross, and we still do, back and forth Harrow Strait. <coughs> And that's perpendicular to the course of most of these big ships. And at turn point, you don't have much visibility. And if you don't have big motors, which we are being environmental, we don't, or sometimes it's human powered, what, what are the alternatives? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I, Will there be I'm, safe corridors, for instance? Can we make safe human corridors? Well, that's a good thing to ask for. Corridors? That's a good thing to ask for. Yeah. Tom? Why haven't you included in your list of what we can do getting rid of Rick Larson? <laughs> yes. Tom, that's, that's it transcends <laughs> politics, Sarah. It's way beyond that. No, not in this group. <laughs> Man. Uh, if you want some marketing, I do. Um, there's a lot of people who are talking. <laughs> he seems yeah. to have an abundance of them. Yes. yes. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I work for the um, volunteer for the league on um, legislative issues from oil spills. And um, I want to say two things. One about the oil definition bill. It had a very low profile, you know, in the state legislature. So maybe next year, I wasn't even aware of that. I, the environmental groups haven't ever mentioned it for them. Mm -hmm. So having it have a higher mm -hmm. profile and yeah. more support, That's a good point. that yes. could be helpful. Yeah. And mainly, I've worked on the oil transportation.
transportation safety bill, mm -hmm. and um, which was a which was a bill to um, get more transparency about oil transports, where the refineries uh, facilities would have to um, uh, say what kind of oil, how much oil, mode of transportation, both that they received and they uh, exported out. And then a lot of time requirements with that too. And I think it was interesting. Is anybody interested in what happened to That was a great bill. I was really fortunate to do yeah, that. Yes, this is kind of what happened in the state. And I just said if anybody's interested. Um, and it, you, there wasn't in the hearing for the bill, it was an environmental priorities commission, there wasn't much presence from the San Juans. There was a lot of pushback from the Columbia River bar pilots that did not want Oh, yes. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I didn't hear anybody speak about your issues up here, which are so important. Yes. And also, the, the, representative, the representative Morris put an amendment on at the end of the bill that we can get, so you might want to go over what this amendment was. Okay. It passed the House, but it was going to get a hearing in the Senate. Right? But one thing did come out which is $300,000 for a Department of Ecology study of open oil and marine. And it will be reintroduced next year, so you might want to get your input into the bill while you're rewriting it. So one thing that we all can do Thank is you. encourage our county council to be more uh, active and more uh, involved down in Olympia during the legislative session. Yeah. A number of county councils, like Clown County, a number of them came down yeah, and testified as far yeah. as I know, didn't Yeah. No. Yeah. Bad, bad. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. 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 But, um, we should definitely be uh, be following that next year. You're right. Yeah. And and we as citizens, though, we can we can speak up during the legislative but session. Thank you for the presentation. I learned tremendously. Good. It's a lot. Yeah. So. Um, this question stems from the, I've been a recreational voter up in these islands and up to desolation and beyond for 60 years. And um, with my husband and myself, especially in the last five years, we've noticed a huge degradation of the waters and the wildlife, uh, astonishingly so. So my question is, is there information that we could help post at some of the marinas, or could this information be at the state parks at, you know, the different, not only marinas, but outposts and camping areas um, for the outreach? Because I think a lot of voters probably share um, some of the same concerns. We're, we've been talking about that, getting the, the voters, right, Janet? Getting the border voters more involved. So thank you for saying that, because yeah. that's just another. Good idea. Another Maybe push. You take the Darling County Show to the Yacht Club and the, the Sailing Club on the island, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, they might be really grateful for that information. Mm -hmm. yes. I, I wanted to mention some good news, and that is we have a committee with Opalco and the Conservation District and the uh, Renewable Energy uh, activists here on the islands, and we've put together a plan to put uh, community solar arrays on the schools on all four of the major islands. Do we know anything about when the Lummi have to be responded to? An outer limit or something? Yeah. You know, the, the, the tribes have a a nation to nation relationship with the US government and um, and I don't know what the process is for that. Um, so I, I don't have an answer that but I can I think they're waiting can, like we all are yeah. for the draft environmental yeah. impact statement to come out. There's a presentation on Orcas next Friday That's right. by the Lumi. Thank you. Yes, at the Odd Fellow Hall on Orcas Island on uh, Friday at 6.30, is it, or 5.30? I, I think it's 7, but I may not, I'm not okay. sure. Well, it's, you can Google it and pull it up on the Do the you know, Janet? I'm, I'm not sure of the time, but that's the right date. I believe okay. it's 6.30 to 8.30. Okay. 
Good. Yes, I think oh, that's right. On, on Friday. Yeah, very difficult. Yeah, and one other public service announcement. This Saturday here at the library is a screening of Momenta, which is a documentary film about um, this whole fossil fuel transport issue. Um, and it, I've seen the trailer. It looks great. So 7 o'clock um, here in the library on Saturday. So, Tasha? Um, in your immersion on this topic, did it come up how this might impact our ferry system? Good or just question. human transport in general in good. the event of a spill? Yeah, good question. Because in the event of a spill, it could, um, you know, one, if there is a spill, they don't allow vessels to go through the area that's been affected. Um, and so that could significantly interrupt ferry traffic while this cleanup is going on. And that is a big issue. And it's, it's something that was considered in the analysis that the state did back in 2012. But yeah, that's a really good question. Mm -hmm. Does the general increase limit our ferries in scheduling themselves? Oh, you in mean the just the it just with the additional vessel yeah, traffic? Besides the spill, right. rain, is there just mm -hmm. having all these bigger boats out there all the time? Is that going to give our ferry system second priority or limitations on when they can schedule ferry runs? Not that I know of, but that's a good question. We should look into that. Jeff? We shouldn't think that if there's an emergency, the ferries can go through the spills because from an engineering standpoint, you can't go through no, right, the oil right. spill because it will ruin the coolers. Right. It would the ships will the, stop. It would interrupt the service. So there's no emergency, no thinking that in an emergency they'll get here. They can't. It's right. not possible. Okay, well, thank you all. Thank you. I suggest that if any of you belong to groups who you think should hear from Lovell and Sean, that you let them know that Lovell and Sean are willing to take their talk on the road. And we would like the word spread as much as possible. I completely forgot to get this out. This is a sign-up sheet. If you want to be on the San Juan Islanders for Say Should Be email list, and you're not already, please sign up. I'll put this in the back of the room. Thank you all for coming and for participating in the discussion. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom.